Good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Um, thank you guys for tuning in and joining us today. Um, this episode of SMWS Presents is very special and is um, kind of a really big deal for me because, you know, throughout my personal whiskey journey, I have met some really incredible, you know, people doing even more incredible things um, in the world of whiskey. And our guest today is um, one of those people who is just left a, a mark on my heart, so to speak. And uh, I, I feel very fortunate to, um, you know, have him here and to share this moment with you all um, and to, you know, share some more whiskey knowledge. Um, there is a distillery in the southeastern kind of coastal region of Ireland right now that is probably hands down one of the most talked about distilleries, um, you know, in Ireland, if not the world at the moment. And they are really on this, you know, mission to, to bring this, you know, kind of new wave to the world of whiskey. And it is, you know, for me personally, it's very exciting. And uh, I know for a lot of other people out there, it is very exciting too. And so, um, I'm ready to kind of kick this off and uh, we won't waste any more time me getting emotional or anything like that. So um, without further ado, I am bringing on um, head distiller of Waterford Distillery out in Waterford, Ireland, Mr. Nega Hand. So hi, welcome. Hello, Jenna. How are you? I am, I am doing so well now that I get to sit here and, and have an hour with you. So um, yeah, thank you I, for being I, I, here. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is there. <laughs> some parts of the world. And I'd just like to say, Jenna, you left a mark on our hearts as well. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm a, it was a very special moment for me. So um, I actually went to visit Waterford last April. So April of last year and uh, kind of got a full. And I felt like in the time that I, I came to visit you all, I learned more in those two days than I think I ever learned in college. Like that was, that was just the amount of information yeah. was crazy. Yeah, and I suppose, yeah, like we are information overload probably, but uh, you, you got to hold lambs and do all that as well. <laughs> I did. You, you, were, uh, you got the royal treatment, um, but I think a lot of people get not quite the same level of treatment, but... <laughs> So yeah. Well, I feel very special. Um, we miss you. Everyone, everyone here, Grace, Grace, Megan, Neil, and everyone said to say hello as well. So okay. Well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you all. I hope when this is all you know over with, I can you know get back on yeah. an airplane and get out you there too. to visit you all. Yeah. So, um, so you know, I just want to kind of share with you know our members and everyone who's watching really what. Waterford is up to and so um, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today and in that big famous terroir word um, and we'll, we'll touch a little on that too yes, but uh, yeah, yeah. To, to kind of kick this off you know can you share a little bit about your history and and who you are and how you kind of came to be the head distiller of one of the most talked about distilleries in the world yeah and even when you're saying that we were just mentioned before come on even say that just a bit mentally, you know, that yeah, we, we've just released, so everyone is kind of we're, we're on everyone's lips. Well, anyone who can drink it, we're definitely on their lips anyway. Uh, but um, I suppose, hello, I'm Ned Gann, I'm the head distiller in Walford here. Um, and I was saying to Jenna, and she knows as well, this is my first whiskey job, so uh, it, it's it's exciting for me as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I worked for Diageo for 15 years or Guinness. Uh, here in the Walford site, um, um, I started as an operator, uh, spent a good few years uh, learning to be a brewer and, and all that, working driving forklifts, and then moved into some com compliance roles um, and bits and pieces like that. So I got a good overview of the whole of the whole business, I suppose that way. Um, and Diageo um, closed the site then in 2013. Uh, I was made redundant and uh, decided to take a year out to mind the kids. Um, you know, getting a few pounds, I said it would be the only chance I'd get to do that. So I took a year out and was about to start in a new job in a uh, in pharmaceutical factory here in Waterford. And I kind of met Mark Rainier by chance. It that when he was looking to buy uh, the brewery, he visited with uh, Richard Forsyth. And I got a call from a guy here, Eugene, who was kind of 
uh, caretaker uh, of, at the time said they're asking some questions about production and the way the plant ran and stuff. He said, would you be able to come in? I said, yeah, I'll be in a few minutes. So I came in and uh, got some, uh, I didn't get the correct information, let's just put it like that. I was told there was a Scottish lad buying the distillery, or buying a tomato distillery, and there was an English lad there, and he didn't know who he was. So when I went in and I met Richard and Mark, and there was another guy from Four Sites, uh, I sat with me back to Mark and I spent the time talking to the two guys from Four Sites. I didn't know they were from Four Sites. <laughs> Uh, trying to impress him. So we went out for a walk and uh, showed him around the whole lot. And then when they were going off, they said, thanks very much. And uh, uh, Mark would shake my hand and there was a few pounds in, in in his hand. And I wouldn't take it off him because that's not what I was looking for. So that was grand. So when I did find out then who Mark Rainier was and bits and pieces, I sent him a message, I think on LinkedIn, say oh do you remember me um um you know if, if there's any jobs going uh whatever so he contacted me when we came in and um as as anyone who will know mark will know uh mark does the talk and uses the listening for, for yes. a long time <laughs> um so at the end of the chat he said what are you looking for um i said well i don't really know i said um i'm due to start this was a thursday i was due to start a new job on monday I said, tell me there's a job now, tell me there's no job, or tell me there's a job in six months time or whatever. So that was grand left, not thinking that and would come over, got a phone call to say, yeah, yeah, come on in, and we'll give you a job. No discussion about what the job was, money, <laughs> anything at all, but you just want to work for Mark. He fills you with enthusiasm, the passion, the vision, the drive is just unbelievable. Uh, so I had to ring the job I was going to start in and say, well, actually, I'm not starting. In fairness, they were very good and they understood. And started then, we started in, I started on the 15th of January, I think, uh, 2015 and came in. Um, so when we came in, there was Anthony Brazel, who is the engineer, Paul is the manager, uh, and, he, and Eugene were here. So we basically start and started to, to go to the place and renovate uh, what was the brewery into a distillery and um, so i was at that for a while so literally pulling wires fixing things up giving the lads a hand um and then mark said to me one day would you like to be head distiller after about six months and i said yeah sure why not like you know <laughs> and having no experience in whiskey obviously knew how to brew beer i had no experience in whiskey didn't even know terminologies, didn't know anything about it. And uh, Mark took a huge punt. Um, I think the the board probably wanted to bring in a, a, a distiller, probably from Scotland, and uh, Mark gave me a chance. And like, and it was literally, um, it was literally a probation period to see how it got on. And the rest they say is history. That's such an incredible story. Like, yeah. I think that's, that's a story you hear in a movie or, you know, that is... Yeah, well, I, I, kind of that's been said, and I think George Clooney is probably in the background there to play me at some stage, uh, <laughs> you know, so... But, yeah, no, it was a huge, it was a huge punt uh, from Mark. Um, and what he wanted was, he didn't want a uh, head distiller to be someone who was going out and being all um, talking about it and, and that he wanted someone who could actually distill who could understand the process and could work like that. So at the time, Lisa Ryan was here as head brewer. So he wanted a head brewer and a head distiller um, to kind of work and understand and be able to make changes on the hoof and work with the, the barley that was coming in. So Neil Neil Conway is the head brewer now. Lisa's gone to Carlo. Um, so that's the way it works, that, you know, he wants people to understand it. Um, and can make the whiskey and not someone who's a figurehead or a, a PR guru or good looking and stuff. So I don't take any of those boxes, uh, but, you know, understand how we want to make our whiskey. Right. Yeah. So for, for everyone listening who doesn't know, Mark Renier is um, Brook Lottie fame. Yes. Um, yeah. He was one of the, as I call them, the three Prince Charmings who kind of brought that distillery back to life. So um 
So I, I heard a story that the reason he, after you know he left, you know Scotland, that I heard that Duncan McGilvery was actually the person who kind of planted that little seed in his ear that the best barley is grown in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he he, he tells the story himself really well, and that Duncan unfortunately passed away recently. He was a very good friend of Mark's. Uh, had said to him the best barley he ever saw came from the southeast of Ireland. Uh, so that um, note was in Mark's head and it struck a chord. And obviously when he left Brookladdy, he he didn't he, he felt himself it wasn't time for him to go. Uh, so when, when that did happen, uh, he still had a drive and a passion to do terror war. Uh, they had obviously started in uh, Brookladdy and I suppose one of the big differences in 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 Brookladdy and probably in Northern Waterford is uh, there was a lot of traditionists in in Isla, and it took them a long time to get the concept of tower and the whole idea is up and running. Whereas when he came to Waterford, there was no resistance, basically because we had the clue, you know. So you know he he got no resistance at all. So everything was you know full steam ahead. But when he we, when he looked into somewhere in southeast of Ireland, the the brewery was for sale, so it had been closed in December twenty thirteen, and Mark was looking for somewhere, and this was here, and for people who may not know, uh, the, the site has been here since seventeen ninety two, actually the first recorded um, um, date in seventeen ninety two was the fourteenth of February Valentine's Day. So I think that's why there's a bit of love always around war. <laughs> we exude that bit of uh, a bit of love in, in, in what we're doing as well. So 1792, the, the the brewery was here since, but in 2003, Diageo spent 40 million euros converting it from what was a traditional brewery where we used to make uh, ale, uh, Smithix, if, if anyone knows of it, uh, and they would have made some lagers as well and done some. Uh, cask or kegging of, of, of uh, cider. Uh, they spent 40 million euros and they transferred it from a brewery to uh, what was called um, um, a BBA plant or beer blending agent plant. So what they did was uh, we used to uh, roast barley. So we'd take in barley and we had a roasting plant. And basically we would make Guinness extract for foreign markets. So at the time, I think Nigeria was the second biggest market for Guinness in the world. And there was a plant in Dublin in St. James's Gate that supplied them. But as the market was growing, uh, the plant wasn't big enough. So Diageo decided to spend the money with us. So we would supply, prob I think, around 40 different smaller markets. So 40 million uh, state-of-the-art facility and that they closed in 2013, so 10 years later. So when Mark was looking at it, this was uh, the total opposite to Brookladdy. Uh, everything was brand new, state of the art. We had we have uh, a wet mill and a mash filter. Yes, you I want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that you just don't see anywhere else. Uh, everything here we have thermoregulated uh, washbacks or fermenters, uh, and we have. Pressure valve, pressure transmitters, temperature probes, and everything is recorded. So it's all singing, all dancing. And Mark said it's more like a facilitator. It's not a, a it's not a, a beautiful distillery like you'll see on Isla or anywhere in in space Isle or the Highlands. And even in fairness, some of the distilleries are. Uh, it's not like that. It is a, a, a factory setting as such for for a distillery. Yeah. So when you kind of what would you when you know COVID is over and it is safe for us to travel again, I highly recommend you know paying a visit to them um, when yeah. it is it is possible. But when you get to Waterford and you're standing outside those gates, it's it's definitely like a, a Charlie Bucket moment. You know, standing there, the beautiful gates that say Waterford Distillery, and you're looking through the gates and you can see to the left is where your old the older buildings are. So the yeah. the first brewery from the late 1700s, right? 1792, yeah. So you see that on the left, and then on the right is the facilitator or the massive, you know, what was once, you know, this this huge brewery that you know Diageo built, and it's you can see it coming in on the train, 
you know, into Waterford, kind of overlooking the water. It's huge. Yeah, it, it is. And even, you know, as you're, you're, if you're coming into Waterford from Dublin uh, or Wexford side or anywhere around there to Kenny, uh, if you're on the train, you'll see it. If you're coming across on traf and the road, you'll see it. And you just see this building. And it was when it was designed, the guy who designed it wanted to uh, give the effect of it being a huge fish on the side of the wall because we're on the, on the banks of the river shore. So when you look at it, it looks like a, a huge fish and the rose house, which now stores the grain for us and stuff, looks like the tail of a fish. So that was the design and the plant, and the plant then is, uh, the outside of it is uh, carved with ridges. Um, and you, you'll see that, but even people who are from water and who pass it every day of the week, don't understand probably how big the site is <laughs> into the yard and up the back and the whole lot so there's a huge amount of room in it like so it's a bit deceptive I suppose yeah yes when I I remember walking in there for the first time and it, it's just it's so much to take in it's it's really unlike anything you know and, and like when you're here the whole time it just it's second nature like you don't right you know. <laughs> but it is funny it is funny when you see people coming in who haven't been here before and they stop and they kind of they're looking around and they're they're a bit you know nearly overwhelmed at the size and 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 the scale of it and i said like we are here every day so we're used to looking at it right so um so mark essentially converted this you know old brewing facility into a distillery so a yeah. lot of the equipment that you have inside is still was used to make you know yeah. beer so yeah so any like if you're making whiskey two thirds of making whiskey is brewing um so the brew house of the mash house everton was left behind is running today and uh, when diageo left they they wiped the software and they took a few bits and pieces but they left the majority of equipment here so to get it back up and running from from when mark bought it to our first distillation trial distillation was a year and a day or two days and uh, a huge turnaround really really quick like <laughs> and one of the reasons we had to wonder mark mark says something he might say something to you and i think his birthday is the 9th or the 10th of december i forget the exact date we started and he said during the year oh he said i'd like it for running for my birthday so you know <laughs> when, when he kind of says that to you you say yeah you pay attention say okay we, we better try and get this going so we got it going, I think it was the 9th of December, and maybe his birthday is the 10th, something like that, yeah. So we got our first uh, trial run on, on Spirit and on the 9th of December. Um, but just going back to what Duncan said as well about the barley, um, about it being so good. And yeah, we we would think, we think Ireland is exceptionally good for growing barley, uh, especially the Southeast. So if you, you, if you look at Ireland, it's not a huge country, uh, like probably fit in one of, your, one of the American states or something, population uh, of around 4 million people. Uh, if you were to drive it, depending on the speed, you'd tap the bottom in five or six hours, like, you know. <laughs> depending on how many pubs you stopped in. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's relatively, it's a small country. But if you, if you look at it in terms of uh, climate, uh, the southeast of Ireland is called the sunny southeast. Um, and really the, the, the grain growers are based in the southeast. You would have dairy uh, people, dairy farmers are kind of uh, uh, Munster towards the Midlands and right in the Midlands of Ireland are the cattle people just because of the, the ground and the soil and the whole lot. And basically what barley needs as a plant is it needs um, illumination or, or some length of days of, of sun. So we're not like Australia or some or parts of America where we get terribly hot days. But what we do get is we get in the summer, we could get 14 hours of sunlight and barley loves that. Um, so that's why barley grows well. And then the soil, uh, you get it, you get good growing conditions with enough rain and stuff. And you have uh, barley, which is best, uh, the best thing for making whiskey, we think. Wow. So they say. Yeah, so they say. So let's talk more a little bit about barley and how Waterford is, you know, highlighting that that beautiful raw ingredient. So um, you guys are essentially taking independent farms. 
So you have what over eighty? Uh so I think we I should have done a count, but I think we're heading towards a hundred independent farms now. Wow. So you have over a hundred different independent farms growing barley for you all. And then you're taking well, that Yeah. So so what we have is rough we have roughly forty farms every year. Okay. Um, so I think we've got 150 batches done from roughly 100 different farmers at this stage. So year one, uh, year one, we did 31 batches. Uh, so that was 2016. And of that 31, we had organic, which was made up of six farmers. Okay. In year one, we had, um, what was that? 36 different farms. Um, so that's the way it goes. And then some of those farms who supplied us in year one didn't supply us again. So we at today we have about 150 batches from a hundred different farmers. Okay. Very that's that's yeah. pretty brilliant. So can you kind of walk us through the the kind of the process? So you have all of these these farms who are and these farmers who are growing for you. Can you tell me how you treat that individual barley that is yeah, from so those individual farms. I, I suppose, why, why are we doing that, Mark? Uh, you know, people have heard of terroir and I, I, I've seen we're, we're associated with terroir, I suppose. It's one of the things that we're associated with. But basically what we, what we wanted to do was we want to have single farms. So um, I'm not sure do people know or not, but Irish whiskey, you don't have to use Irish grain. So it can be Irish whiskey and you can get, get grain from uh, England, Ukraine, France, wherever. But we chose only to use Irish grain because we think it's the best barley, best grain in the world. So that was the original concept. And then one, we wanted to use single farms. So how do we do that and how do we keep everything separate? So in May 2015, Mark, uh, met with uh, the Dalton brothers in Kilkenny and uh, we work with Minch Malt. So the conversation was, uh, we want to have single farms kept separate throughout the whole process, but we need to have it at the very start. We need to be able to store them separately. Otherwise the project doesn't work. So they had a conversation in May, they shook hands and Dalton's went and built what we call the cathedral. <laughs> Which is, uh, which is, uh, you were at the cathedral, were you? Um, I wasn't at the, I did not see the cathedral, no. Oh, Jeannie Max, they slipped up with that one. But anyway, <laughs> so basically what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a storage facility with individual bays. So what we do then is we work with Minch Malt and they work with the farmers. I suppose some people think we have a contract with the farmers and we don't. Uh, we have very, very good relationship with the farmers, but we have a contract. Minch malt and they have a contract with the farmers. So the farmers, so each year uh, the farmers will grow roughly about 120 tons of barley. And normally what would happen then is the farmer would bring it into the merchant and they dry it and make, look after. But what we do is uh, we talk about three T's, terroir, traceability and transparency. So to ensure traceability, Dalton's will actually go out and collect the grain. So, and we can trace all of that. We can, you know, we have, we have load schedules, we have uh, dockets, we have all that. So Dalton's will go out and collect the grain and bring it in. And they put uh, the three or four lorry loads of, we'll say, uh, Jenna's, Jenna's farm together in a pile. And that's dried individually. Okay. What normally would happen is, uh, the lorries would just keep rolling, keep rolling, keep rolling and put it into thousands and thousands of tons of barley. And that's all just dried together. So no segregation. But we have segregation, single farm, and that's dried in our own, um, in, in a, se a separate dryer, a specific dryer. And when that's dried, then it's put into the cathedral, into the individual bays, and it's it's kept separate. And in that individual bay, we have uh, an aeration system to keep that fresh as well. So when they built that, I think they built 28 bays and we could use the middle. So about 32, we could fit in that. Uh, and the last couple of years, then we had to build another one because we got a bit bigger. So 
cathedral and we have the chapel, which is a smaller one beside it. So that's just built for us. So uh, if you were to put grain uh, normally in in the in the cathedral, you'd probably fit seven thousand tons, and we use wow. it, and we put about three and a half thousand tons in it, just the way we keep it separate, and that. So you know that's the start of the single farm and keep it separate. Right, and that and the for the traceability factor, you know, having them come pick the grain up from the farmer versus the farmer taking the grain, you know, that's just one extra step to ensure yes. that traceability. Like uh, everything that we do is adding a small bit of cost to us, but we want to do it to ensure that we can say this is uh, Jenna's uh, grain that came from Jenna's farm. Like well, when I'm talking about traceability, we can st we start back and we can say that Jenna sold uh, this variety of grain in this field on this date. And everything that happens in the field afterwards, like we we can ha we have data uh, to see what the weather was like uh, every day that that seed and barley was in the ground after it was harvested. So and if we I wanted to know, you know, ten days into me sowing, you know, my field, what the weather was like, you know, what how the shade was hitting certain parts of the field, you would be able yeah, so to we, we, we trace can all look of up, that. Yeah, so we can look look we can look up. Uh, Pressures, temperatures, rainfall, snowfall, uh, all that. And I suppose what helps us do that is we built our own system. Keen, who was one of the one of the geniuses behind that, the genius behind that, built what we call the Pro Trace. And basically, uh, he 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 taps into the nearest weather station, which is probably only a couple of kilometers away, and get all that information. And that's all there. And that's all information at some stage uh, might be helpful for people to try and uh, look at what's inference and um, flavors and the whole lot. So we have that. Uh, so when it's at Dalton's, then it's, it stays there for probably six, up, maybe even 12 months or whatever. Uh, and when it starts to break down, see, we'll start calling it uh, into, into Minch Malt, which is in a toy. So Dalton's then bring it from uh, Kilkenny, where it's malted individually. Uh, again, inch malt, malt thousands and thousands of tons, but they get the batch of Jenna's uh, grain. So what was maybe 120 tons at the start, uh, through the drying process and screenings might be down to 100 tons, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's malted then, so we it, they, they call it the Bowie plant. Um, so the reason uh, these volumes were kind of looked at was because the Bobby plant could do around 100 tons of barley. So that 100 tons then gets malted and becomes roughly around 75 tons of malted barley to us. And the other thing is in Ireland, uh, when you're malting, you're allowed to use enzymes and we don't use enzymes. Right. It adds a little bit of time and there's a bit of tweaking to be done as well. And and also we're not we're going to be a natural whiskey. No no enzymes at all. Um no colouring, no nothing. It's it's barley, water, yeast, and the cask. That's and that's how it should be, right? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, <laughs> that's the way that's the way we're doing it. That's the way we're doing it. Um, so in, in talking about um, some of the, the farms and the farmers, so you're doing organic, conventional, biodynamic, and then heritage, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I came to when I came to visit back in April, we actually visited Trevor Harris's farm. Um, yes. And I got to learn about biodynamics, which I knew a little bit about it um, because uh, Mark Newton had kind of given me some good research material before I got there. Um, and so... I knew vaguely, you know, but to experience it in, in real life and to see it with your own eyes. Um, so essentially biodynamics is to where you can stimulate the microbial activity of the soil um, through this kind of series of preparations. So um, I believe when we were at Trevor Harris's farm, he took the cow horns yeah, that yeah, were yeah. packed with um, 500, which is essentially manure oh, from a oh, lactating yeah, female yeah. Yeah, that gets buried into the earth and then 
you know, I, I can't remember the length of time that it stays underground. Um, if Grace is there, I know she'll know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's it's a, it's a few months. It's and it's a specific. It's a season. Yeah, at specific times of the year as well. Correct. So I think it work all works on like a a, a calendar, like a lunar calendar. Um, yeah, yeah. If I'm yeah, if I'm getting it, that right. Yeah, no, like I suppose um, the majority of our farms are conventional. And we have organic, biodynamic, and we have some heritage as well. But the biodynamic has piqued a lot of interest. And, like, I suppose one of the a way that I'd like to explain biodynamics is you're farming in conjunction with the earth and nature. So you're trying to keep everything in harmony, which sounds a bit uh, hairy, fairy, and, and, and mad. And it is a bit like, uh, your your the lunar calendar, as I said, comes into play. So you're moving with the circle of the earth, the timing of the earth. Um, so you will not sow um, on a day that isn't uh, dictated as such by the lunar calendar. And the day you might have to be sown, or the period of time you have to be, might have to be sown, might be raining, but you sow anyway, uh, because you're working in harmony with the earth and the soil. Um, and one of the things I was I was talking to John before, um, and I was just trying to get to grips on what is biodynamics and farming and the method. And he said, when a conventional when a conventional farmer sees a weed uh, cropping up, he'll spray it. But when a biodynamic farmer sees a weed cropping up, he wants to know what is what nutrients are what's feeding that weed that's not going to uh, the plant or whatever you're trying to grow and how do you get the balance back right so that the weed doesn't grow and goes where it's supposed to go. Right. That kind of, you know, summed it up in layman's terms and it sounds mad, it is mad, but I'm telling you the flavors are brilliant. <laughs> I I think before I came there and experienced it, I thought maybe it was a little mad. Um, but in, in seeing all the, the effort and the, and the love and the precision that goes into biodynamic farming, you know, I yeah. don't know if there's anyone out there who would just do that for the hay of it, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's well, a lot there's, of work. There's a lot of, there's a lot of work in it. Probably there's a lot more work even than organic. Like you mentioned preparation 500, uh, the other preparation is 501 where they get, uh, is it silica and rain mm -hmm. sprayed out in the ground and. Again, it's done at different times. Times like they, the far, the biodynamic farmers will know uh, what type of soil their soil is. Like if it's if it's uh, water soil, and again, it's not water in terms of being wet, but in terms of the cycles of the, the earth and that. Like you'd say, you'll have a fire soil or water soil or whatever, and they'll know what that what their soils are and what will work for them and stuff. And they know the they know the rhythms of nature uh, and the soil and how best it works. It sounds it sounds but it sounds mad. But I suppose uh, it it it's well known in mine. And I think Mark said to me before, eight of the top ten wines in the world are biodynamically grown, but people just don't talk about it. Uh, they don't talk about it because some people have uh, have this concept of oh that's mad. And, <laughs> We can't like that, but if you're just doing, if you're just drinking what the wine because the flavors are exceptional, uh, then biodynamics is just happens to be the way it's grown. And right. So for us, it's a small part of it. It's it's we're the only bio, I think we're the only biodynamic uh, commercial farmers in Ireland. Fairly sure. Mark had done some biodynamics in Brook Laddie before, so we're not the first in the world, but. I think we're the next in the world, second in the world, and we're not doing it on a small scale. Uh, like we're, we're like in terms of uh, so. If you look at it in terms of the, a single farm that we would do, uh, we'd fill maybe two hundred casks per farm, and the biodynamics we have three farmers growing, and uh, because the yields are so low, um, and we'll fill probably in around a hundred or hundred and ten casks which is half the size with three farmers. Right. Still fairly considerable uh, amount of whiskey. Yeah, I think that's, um, 
I, I hope to to continue to learn more about the whole biodynamics yeah. and to see more of that in whiskey because I think it's very interesting. And um, you know, to yeah, the, I suppose the thing about it is it is expensive to buy biodynamic barley is expensive. Um, we are like we are very very fortunate. We have brilliant investors here, and they give us more or less free reign, like to to get biodynamic barley, organic barley on a big scale, and the the, the heritage varieties. So those heritage varieties yield very badly, uh, um, but just have different flavors. But we have we can go and do that because we have good investors. And they're looking at the long term picture. A lot of distilleries who are up and running are trying to keep going. You know, they can afford to buy ordinary barley and that's what they can afford to do. And they'll do the best job they can do with that. So I'm not saying what we're doing is, is what everyone should be doing, but uh, it's what we're doing. Well, to, to kind of take, you know, go from the farm and back to the distillery and, and kind of, you know, talking about that terroir term. So terroir has been, you know, that term has been around for, you know, what feels like ages, you know, in the wine world. Um, I, I know the very, you know, little I do know about wine. I know that that's a term that, you know, is thrown around often. And yeah. it's funny because, you know, over probably the past year, year and a half, you know, on just, you know, more distillery visits that I've been on and, and just talking with people throughout the industry, it's a term that I'm hearing more and more, you know, when it comes to whiskey. And so can you kind of talk about, you know, maybe touch on the terroir project or kind of how yeah. Waterford is setting out to, you know, show that just like terroir exists in wine or in your cucumbers or, you know, whatever the in, case is. In, in, in flowers, like uh, I, have you hydrangeas in America where, Depending on the soil, they'll be pink or blue, depending on the pH of the soil. So, so for for us, like this is kind of it's terroir driven. In what some people may know what terroir is, but it is the what influences the barley and how it grows. So the soil, topography, weather, obviously, uh, um, people influence it. So what influences that? So it's it's been well recognized in wine that it it it, it, it influences uh, your grape. Um, it, it hasn't been looked at in terms of whiskey because people think that dis dis distillation is a destructive process. Uh, I wouldn't agree with that, um, and that you know flavors don't come through, and that a cask is, gives it fifty or sixty or seventy percent of its flavor. We don't we don't agree with that either, but we we talk about that maybe after. But what we're doing is uh, like we're in a fortune position. We can taste the new make um, off every farm, and there's differences. Some subtle differences, some big differences. And with the the facilitator here, we can keep the process as repeatable as possible. So we can you know keep distillations. Uh, fermentations uh, fairly fairly close now we work with the farm so if the farm is telling us uh, I'm finished or I'm happy at this point we, we'll move it on but Everton is fairly fairly well within uh, certain specifications we we'll put it like that so Mark wanted a piece of paper basically to say uh, terroir exists in malt and barley for Irish whiskey we believe it we taste it but there's, also, there's always people out there who are kind of naysayers and doubters. And it's a fairly big statement for some distilleries if it's not true. If it, if it is true, sorry. So if they think, you know, they've never, they've kind of said barley is barley is barley. Uh, so it, it could have a big impact on the industry. So Mark wanted a piece of paper, uh, basically scientifically proven that terror exists. So he had read a study that a guy called Dr. D Have you met Dustin? No, I haven't. There's a guy, he read a study called by a guy called Dr. Dustin Herb uh, from Oregon State University. Love, lovely guy. And he had done something like that in beer in Oregon and, 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 the, and that. So he contacted him to see what he's interested in the project. And he would have been in, he's interested in doing it. But the only way the two of them wanted to do it is if it was a peer review paper. 
So scientifically proven. So we can give them as much help as possible. And as much as we wanted to say something, we couldn't influence it because D Dustin had to stand in front, has to stand in front uh, uh, of his peers and say, these are the findings, these are the outcomes, discuss. Right. So that, that's the way it started. So obviously Minch Malt are involved, uh, Chagas, who are the Department of Agriculture, they're involved, and, and uh, Tackler and Thompson in Scotland are involved. So big project. It was initially kind of supposed to be two years. It's three years now. So basically we're looking at, say, two plots of, of different land and sowing two varieties on each and doing everything the exact same. So sowing them the same time, days, giving them the same treatments and harvesting. And then we didn't even do the distillations. We sent them away then to Tackler and Thompson where they did identical, identical distillations. So it's out of our hands. We will pay for it uh, and give them whatever support, whatever else was, was done kind of independently. And then, so when that was done, the, the spirit went away. Uh, there was some gas chromatography done with, uh, with uh, Chagas. So basically, a really fancy machine that breaks down uh, the spirit into its elements and gives it values. And there's also three uh, tasting panels uh, assessing the spirit and scoring it and all that. So there's a huge amount of work. <laughs> it was, it, the findings were supposed to be uh, complete and given in May in Edinburgh to uh, the uh, Institute in Bruin. Um, um, uh, Harriet Watt? Yeah, uh, no, it was the Institute in Bruin. There was a conference there. Conference oh, there. okay. I think it was the International Brewing and Distilling Conference. And obviously this COVID kicked into gear, so that's been put on hold. So I think it might be happening at the end of the year. Not 100% sure. Uh, and I suppose Dustin is using the extra time then just to probably do a few more weird. There's, there's yeah. more tastings going on. He's gathering yeah. as much data as he can. But the findings are promising. Uh, I think Mark has probably left a few things out on Twitter and social media and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're confident we will have a piece of paper at the end of it that would, that says terroir does exist on malt and barley for Irish whiskey. That's that's pretty huge. <laughs> yeah, it is huge. And some people have come come back and said, and said, well, if you need a piece of paper to prove it, like, but like we're in, the, I said we're in the fortune position, and anyone who's come and taste the new make, you know, you can taste differences. Uh, when it gets into the cask, then the cask gets an influence. So for the doubters and the naysayers and people who say it doesn't exist, it's to have that piece of paper that Mark literally just wants to wave and say, na -na 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 -na. Oh, the ticket. I told you so. It is a bit like that now. Yeah, so it is, and it is putting, putting our money where our mouth as well in, in that terms, like, you know. Uh, yeah, so that's well, been you, our project. Yeah, so I I remember you know when I went into your little ex your little magic room in the distillery where you have all of these samples. You know, your your that's like a I would I would just sit in that room all day. I think you know there were what felt like thousands of just whiskey samples all around, and and you know when I got to sit down and and really taste through a lot of these, I remember you know you said you know pick I, I picked three different farms all of the same varietal. And I think the varietal I chose was Olympus 2017. Um, and that was, you know, the varietal I picked from three different farms. And so I yeah, have the yeah. new make from three different farms of the same varietal all in front of me. And it was Ballymorgan, the Salt Mills and uh, Meadow Lodge. And so I had all three of those in front of me and I tasted, I just remember tasting the differences in those and that was like a huge moment of yeah like oh my gosh like how is this possible and you know i remember the the one specifically from metal watch smelled like or tasted like a farm like i remember going out to trevor norris's farm or trevor harris's farm and the smell in the air of being out in kind of the farmlands i was tasting that even though that particular yeah. whiskey wasn't from him but i remember tasting that smell in the whiskey and then you know the salt mills being on the coast it was like 
you got that salinity and you're like, how yeah. in the world? Like, and what as, are you as, guys as, doing? Yeah, no, <laughs> as we're, we're doing that. We're doing that. We're trying our best to show, let, let, let the spirit high, be highlighted, the barley be highlighted. But I suppose one of the things actually we found from the Terroir Project, coincidentally, and when you mentioned varieties, is that varieties make very little difference. Mm -hmm. And the main reason is prior to about 1970, uh, there wasn't a lot of work put into uh, uh, grain, into varieties. And then obviously with, with, uh, with, with demand for um, grain, uh people got involved to improve yield uh of of grains and uh to stand against uh the weather so the straw length and pesticides and the whole lot so what happened then is they brought together varieties and start to put them together so the varieties of of this generation now at the moment are literally brothers and sisters so that was one of the things that was found that varieties had less of an impact than we actually thought and we're seeing that when we're doing heritage so heritage are old varieties um so we've done hunter uh i'll tell you about that in a minute now uh neil will give out to me in a minute but we've done hunter uh which was uh, 19 finished 1956 and we're going to do gold tarp which was around 1900 so we did we did uh hunter last year we're actually brewing hunter now at the moment and the first one, the first brew of the first brew we were doing today of Hunter didn't work out very well, and we, it, yeah, it's, we 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 lost a little bit of it just because it's hard to work with and all that. But the flavors from the heritage are so different because they are away from um, modernization in a way. at the moment, um, and it's nice to see that. So we're we're going to do more. Uh, heritage grains uh what w one of the things mark said to neil there a while ago was find an old irish variety for me so mark says that he has to go it. so even like we could look at maybe uh at doing that and also yeast we we when, when i'm talking about letting the spirit and the barley talk we use the same yeast the whole time we get it from mary's distilling yeast because we don't want that to influence the flavor we try and keep the uh, washback times similar so that we're not getting a huge variation. We have a very, very long fermentation because we're looking for secondary fermentation, malolactic fermentation. It's like 120 hours? Uh, about 120 hours, yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, again, we're not doing this for quantity. We're doing it for the quality. What we're looking is uh, to get is a light, elegant, like myself, floral, fruity spirit okay and you can do that so people have said to me well um a certain distillery has a, a flavor from it and they're not worried about terroir or where they get the barley but what i would say to them is they have a distillery style of spirit so their style of spirit is that it's not necessarily that flavor of spirit if you get me mm -hmm. so influences you can influence the style of spirit you make so we can have uh so when we're doing our cuts so again we work with the farm the farm there's a question about that okay about your cuts um nathan asked if uh do you do your cuts change per farm uh slightly but what what, what will happen is the starting point uh will be about say 77 or 76 percent uh, and we found we, we don't go very, we have a very tight middle cut, spirit cut. And we go, we, we stay around 66%. We don't go below that then. We might go a little bit below it, but not generally. So our cuts are very tight and, um, and very, if we were to look back on the history of the cuts, they're very close to each other. But we work with what the farm, so there'll be a different starting point and we go down to about 66 and we come off spirit then. Um, so that's why we're, we're trying to keep everything roughly the same, but the farm kind of dictates the flavors as well a little bit. So the cut, the cut point at tails is in around 66. Now some distilleries go down to 63 or 62 even. 
So that's what I'm saying, that the, the distillery decides the style of spirit. You know, that spirit, if you're going down, will be a lot more fainty, heavy, papery. Ours is light and elegant. But the flavor then comes from the barley. So you're really just letting each farm speak for themselves. You're exactly. wanting the, the flavor yeah. of that particular farm to yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. end up in and, the bottle. Yeah, and, and we know we know where we want to do the cuts. We're looking, as I said, for quality, not quantity. So our cut point, uh, our cut points in most distilleries, they'd be saying they're laughing at you. You're 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 not putting next amount into spirit. And what we would say is we are putting, we're collecting the spirit quality we want to collect. We're not losing the rest. It's going to make the low wines and faints. And that's part of our style and balance rolling. That makes sense. It makes, yes, it makes total yeah. sense. Um, I, maybe for me a little extra just because I was there and I got to actually <laughs> experience it. So, um, but I did want to kind of talk about um, a few little things inside of the distillery. Um, just, you know, for, for good fun, because I think they're worth talking about. Um, so you have, um, you know, what, what we talked about, a lot of that old brewing equipment or, well, yeah, state-of-the-art yeah. new brewing equipment. But yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so you all use the hydro mill. And when I was there and I, I got to see that and, and learn about that um, and the, the mash filter, um, I thought those two things were really interesting and brilliant. So I was kind of hoping you would be able to touch on those um, and kind of how you go from the hydro mill to this conversion vessel back, you know, over yeah. to the mesh filter. So, yeah, so Diageo, um, again, 2003 being, they were looking at new technologies and stuff, and uh, they put in a hydro mill, which is basically an underwater mill. Um, so most people in whiskey uh, uh, industry would, uh, and even brewing would know a hammer mill or a roller mill, and especially a Porteous mill. So we mm -hmm. have mill that we used until 2003 and worked really well i think it's there since about 1900 or something like that <laughs> it worked excellent really like brilliant um and i think actually porteous just on a side note actually went out of business because their mills never broke down yep. so yeah once they built them you had them that was it like you know but so we got a hydro mill we got the uh the brew house the mash house uh, came from uh, Muir in uh, Belgium, so they developed it. And so, when we were making the Guinness extract, we had two, we had two barleys that we were offering up to it. So the majority was what we call uh, black grains. So those were the roasted grains. So there were barley that was roasted and offered up, and we also had malt and barley. The malt and barley worked a dream, no problem at all. Uh, the, the the roasted barley uh, bit of a disaster took us a long time took us a long time to go on. so basically what we have is we at the moment now we, we're doing nine and a half ton brews so we bring it bring it over uh, the malt barley is there and we feed it into what's called the steeping chambers or columns so it's a long pipe and the grain comes in and water is jetted in so you're basically wetting the grain okay so it comes down then, and what you hit is you hit a steel um, discs, one rotates and one is stationary. So it rotates, and we can adjust the middle gap then, depending on the size of the grains. Actually, the toughest job in the distillery is Neil Conway's head brewer because every every eight days or so, we have a new farm start, and each farm has to be small adjustments done to get the best out of the barley. So grain size and all that would be slightly different. But we can adjust the mill in and out roughly around 0.75 of a mill. So very close. Yeah. Stationary disc, rotating disc, and we crack open the grain. As the water is As the basically water, yeah, hitting the yeah. grain. Yeah, so it's underwater milling. One of the things with brewing as well was um, it eliminated oxygen at the start. So anyone knows that about brewing, oxygen is your enemy. And uh, so that was one of the things as well, whether that's, uh, I was told that at the time, so that was, that was another part of it. So what happens then, it just goes into what we call the mash conversion vessel, okay? Um, and it sits there, so it's agitated. And we start at about 46 degrees, um, and we leave it there for a period of time. 
and we raise the temperature and what happens at the different temperatures is the natural enzymes are working away um, to convert uh, so that we can make uh, we can when we add the yeast then be all sugary and we'll get we'll get the worth that will make the spirit so that will sit there for about four hours at different temperatures again the azure left it there it's all temperature controlled so when it's converted then we put it into the mash filter so the mash filter is basically it's 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 a filter press it's a plate and frame so uh, there's your plate and either side you have a, a porous sheet and a non-porous sheet it's huge too it, it is it huge, looks yeah. like a giant accordion yeah yeah it, it, is, it is a giant accordion so what happens is then um the the mash is pumped in through channels into that so as it's coming through the channel, it'll fill in between each one of those all the way along until the nine and a half ton brew with water is in there. So when it's in there, we should have an even coat on, on, on your, on your uh, filter. And then we do our first press. So it's a pneumatic press. Yeah, it's a pneumatic press. And what you do then is you start taking the liquid or the strong works out of that. So the liquid get, will go through the porous membranes and stuff and get collected, run through a, a, a pipe and get collected into a, a, what we call the pre-run tank, which is just a holding vessel. And when, that's, when that pre-compression stops, then we put water in and start sparging at around 70 degrees. So it's the same principle as a, a louder ton or a mash ton. We're flushing water through, but the grain is not the bed as such. It flushes uh, the water through the grain and then through the, the filter sheet. Mm -hmm. So you're getting clear, clear work. There's no clear work. Nothing going through it. Um, so uh, Mark likes coming up with names for things. So he calls the filter uh, the terroir extractor. <laughs> so we can extract uh the best or the most liquid out of that so when 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 Diageo were running that on malt and barley uh the extract efficiency was probably 101 or 2 percent wow at, at the moment we're probably about 95 percent because we don't use enzymes right because we have different farm coming every time so that's kind of what we're looking at now mark is not overly interested in efficiencies and stuff but <laughs> for us professionally and trying to get uh, as much uh, as much liquid out as much uh, worked out to make as much uh, casks to make as much whiskey that's what that's what we try and do that so you know we, we we've gone from uh 2018 variety of grain which was a terrible year we had the bees from the east yeah the farmers didn't get so on April. we had a really short year because of the drought and i'll just give you an example we buy roughly two and a half thousand tons of malt of barley every year um and say in year two when we were up and running everyone was going grand uh we aim to make one million la's about 1.4 million uh, liters of bulk and in year two we made which was what 2017 which would have been crop 16 we made uh a uh, million and thirty thousand LAs, okay, which is great. But in tw with twenty eighteen's crop variety distilled in twenty nineteen, we made something like nine hundred and thirty thousand LAs. Wow. Huge. Yeah, that's that's a shitload. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, that equates to about two and a half farms. Wow, like forty thousand LAs from a farm. So you can just see the impact that that year had on that barley same same tonnage and you get that reduced volume like right so that just no and like the thing is if if there was a disaster of a year here in ireland and there was no grain to be got in ireland we just wouldn't make whiskey you know th that's it like we're, we're not going to import and stuff right um but yeah, so the, the, the how did we get we got that the, the facilitator or the, the terroir extractor, the filter. So the other thing from that then is 
the uh, the the spent grain or the draft that comes off that is really dry. So normally uh, from a mash ton or a, a louter ton, you have, your grain is really, really wet. The fact that it's in a press, we can squeeze the living out of it and when it comes out, it's really dry. So the farmers get that and it's, it's, a, it's really dry. And do, I remember you telling me a story about some goats. Oh, that yeah. Live. <laughs> yeah. So does so, some of that go out to the the goats behind the distillery? <laughs> no, no, we, we don't feed the goats. No, it, it, the grain goes to the farmers and the pot goes to the pigs. But yeah, so there's uh, there's goats. This you this is called locally Cherries Brewery, right? Um, but up behind us is uh, called the it's Bilberry. It's the Bilberry Rock. The Bilberry goats. That's right. Uh, but, but up there. Uh, there's goats and the goats have been there since Huguenot times and they're actually a protected species and there's a society that looks after them and sometimes you'd see them down and that but you, you, we have a few pictures up now and again but uh, they used to come down into um, into the, the back of the yard and they might come down very a very odd time and if something happens we have numbers to ring there's numbers there for, for <laughs> to look after the, the goats and every time they come in and check, but yeah, so they're part. Their Bilberry goats are are associated with what was the brewery and now the distillery. <laughs> Who knew that you know in taking on this this old yeah, plant, yeah. you were going to get some goats with it. Some but, goats uh... as well, yeah. And actually, <laughs> a, a good few years ago, when it was a, a the brewery, they could come down and was really really steep the, the rock, and a kid goat actually fell and uh, died. You know. Oh. And it, Someone, someone. A while after that, there was a kid after getting killed in the brewery, like, and forgot to uh, put in the goat, like, part. And yeah, they they got highly, yeah. So I had to go back and tell him all of it. I just assumed they knew there was goats here. Yeah. So anytime I tell that story now, I have to say kid goat. A kid goat. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to touch on, you know, really one more thing because you've made mention, you know, throughout this that you don't rush anything and everything is done, you know, slowly and intentionally, you know, with your 120 hour, you know, fermentation times and, you know, um, distillation is the same way. I remember, you know, you saying that we do yeah. this kind of low and slow and low and slow, yeah. Yeah. And those the stills are the old Inverleven stills that were outside of Brooklady. So yeah. Those, yes, so, yeah, so, so the, the stills, um, they were, they were built uh, in 1972 by Blairs in Edinburgh mm -hmm. and were in Dumbarton and Inverleven. And uh, that was being closed down. A guy called Demolition Dave uh, contacted uh, Brooke Laddie, who knew uh, he might have known Duncan or, or Jim or Mark or something, and uh, said, Listen, I have the job of uh, demolishing this place. I know you're getting up and running. If there's that in there you want, we'll do a deal, come and collect it. So when they got there, Dumbarton seemingly was massive, massive uh, footprint. And they found uh, tree stills. They found our wash still and spirit still. And the wash still was the still outside Brooklady with the wellies in it. And the third still they found was a Loman still, which is Ugly Betty, which makes... Yes. So they, they got a heap of parts and stuff, but they actually got a barge and they put the stills on the barge and sailed it to Isla. Uh, and they, they got Ugly Betty up and running after a while. And I think there was some plan to use the two stills down around Port Charlotte uh, and it never happened. So when Mark was leaving Brooklady, um, he did a deal to take the stills with him. So at the time when we were getting up and running then, um, Four sites are, 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 you know, the premier still builders in the world, probably. Um, so there was a three year waiting list uh, because McAllen were doing their project. So Mark said, I have these two stills. Um, I can get them renovated. So I said earlier on, we got a year and a day after Mark Bath place, we had our first trial spirit run. The reason we, we were able to do that is because we had two stills that were renovated. Um, just to let you know, they had worked on that for about 19 years, so there were there was life left in them, but the life is coming to an end. Yeah, they'll be replaced in summer next year. So okay, 
if an order put in for two stills for summer next year, and we're going for the same style, same stills, and just newer. Right. Um, so yeah, so we we go low and slow. And what, what do we mean by saying low and slow? So when we charge the still up, uh, we say to our spirit still, uh, we can charge it to about thirteen thousand liters, uh, which is just under the door, which is normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do, we charge to about eleven thousand, so you know we have more headroom even again. And when we are uh, putting the steam on, so our wash still has um, a heat exchanger that's pumped around, and our spirit still has internal uh, heater, which is like a radiator for all the world. That's not the technical term, but that's <laughs> uh, so uh, so. Yeah, so when we charge it up about eleven thousand liters, and we bring the steam on really, really slow. So on the base of the design, uh, the turnaround time for the spirit still was about seven, seven and a half hours. At the moment, we're it's taking us about ten hours. Wow. Uh, yeah. So when we put the steam on at the start, uh, we, like I said, forty million. The just spent forty million on on the plant here. We spent an, another few pounds. Ever. <laughs> Uh, except for the safe, which is done manually, and the steam, the steam is semi-automated. So a program will bring the steam on to a point, and then it's up to the distiller to adjust it up and down. So what we do is when we're when we're getting to a flow in at the safe, we go we don't go over three hundred liters an hour on head, which is a trickle. So normally on heads, it's probably on programs and stuff. 10 minutes maybe, but we are probably anywhere between 27 to 33 minutes wow. it's before we make the cut. And the, it's a trickle. So we will probably collect only around 190 to 220 litres on heads before we go on spirit. Uh, and it's done on, on, uh, on nose and uh, depending on what part of the morning is, you can have a little taste of the 77%. And we'll make the cut then. And when we make the cut, turn the handle, we'll put the steam up slightly, but we don't go over 500 litres an hour on spirit. And just to put that into context, when Foresights were over commissioning, they had done all their things on running on spirit at about 13 or 1400 litres an hour. So we're only doing five. <laughs> and when we're on tails, we'll go up to about 1400 litres an hour. So... You know, the steam dictates the flow, mm-hmm. nice and slow. And if you can imagine, steam is your energy. And we're only promoting the light vapors, spirits, because the heavier ones don't have enough energy to go up the neck, across the light arm, and get turned back to liquid. So th- when we're talking about uh, a light, elegant, floral, fruity spirit, we get that light elegance because the heavy vapors don't get a chance to get into the to spirit. get up there, right. Yeah. It'd be like me trying to climb up something. I'd want a hell of a lot of energy to climb up. But you'd scarp up a couple of seconds, Jenna. Like, that's the difference. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I'd want to rock up my arse to get up there. Like, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing. It just it takes, you know, so that's what I talk about style of spirit rather than flavor. So I can influence the style of spirit. I can have a, a, a heavier spirit by having a quicker boil and make those heavier vapors get turned to liquid. And I can have a cut point to 64, 63. So that could just change the style of spirit, but the flavors are just still different from the barley. That's that's a very unique take on, you know, making whiskey and, you know, the, the end product. And let's talk about that. Um, yes, yes. So when will, you know, I've actually All just decided the there's, there's none going to America. I'm not feeling <laughs> America. I have to I'm come there and get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I yeah, I was just I was saying earlier on that the volumes, the volumes for America have just been increased today, which is uh, <laughs> which is great, but puts puts me under a, a fair bit more pressure. And it, <laughs> it's just because our release, I don't know if people know that we released there two weeks ago, feels like two years ago at this stage, and it's just been phenomenal. Like, we did uh, two farms, two single farms first. We did uh, Baddick and Cavan, which is in Leash, and we did Banner, which is in Wexford. 
and we did 8,616 of one, 8,640 of the other, and we went to 10 countries. We went to England, Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, China, Japan, Canada, wow. and somewhere else, can't think of the other one. And we would have sold all 16,000 bottles in Ireland alone. It, it, we were like, that, not only were we taken by surprise, the distributors, everyone was taken by surprise. The demand has been mental. And uh, some people have said, we are creating the demand by only, only releasing a small amount. Mm -hmm. We didn't because we, we weren't getting orders. These, these single farm releases are stepping stones to the Cove, to the Grand Van. So this is just seen as being a, a, an offering to show you what a single farm is like. Like the whiskey that was released, we, we can tell you years, months, and days. So I think the oldest one we've released was Back to Cabin, which was three years, 11 months, and seven or 18 days. I should have these figures on top of my head. It's a so lot to memorize. Nearly four years old. Uh, Banno Island was three and a half years old. So it, it's a snapshot to show you what the whiskey is like at the moment. Uh, single farms and and say this is a, this will be a component in one of the most c complex whiskies in the world. So, but people have gone bananas for it. Yeah, I'm I'm excited too because I haven't actually. I don't think I when I was there because we there was a whiskey that was old enough to legally be, you know, considered whiskey yet. So, how old, how old is that, uh, uh, Valley Morgan? So this is one thousand twenty one days old. Just shy, so right? 70, I think, yeah, 70 days short of whiskey. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Which, you know, is beautiful. And it's, um, you know, it's something that I've been, you know, babying. Well, you, well, know. you have that Bally Morgan. What I have here is I have a little glass and a little bottle. And this is Bally Morgan in the making. So beautiful. this, this is uh, what will be going into, what will be going into the whiskey in the next couple of weeks. So this is... Um, I'm not sure of the age of this, but it's probably another, another year long, I'd say, or something like that. So, yeah. So, America, people want to know what's happening in America. Yes, when are we getting this? Yeah, so it's 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 been made up at the moment, and I'll just refer to... So, as far as I know, um, there will be one, two, three, four releases soon. Wow. So, uh, Dunbell which is uh, Ned Murphy from Kilkenny. You're getting organic. Yay! <laughs> yeah, which is, which is a big one. Rat, Claff and Dunmore. So those four will be going to uh, America. Now, one of these, I'm going to just have to make sure. Uh, you heard it here. This is, so, this is a sneak yes, peek of what's yeah. to come here in the States. So, so three bottles will be going to America uh, to be sold in, in the different states and shops. And oh God, Raj, what's Raj's? He has a distribution. I should know this again. But he, actually, the Dun Bell one is going to be, I think, an online one. Okay. Buy it online and it'll be shipped to you. But the other three will be in the store. So I think the plan is to have them out. We'll probably, I think I'm bottling them the middle of August. So I think this bottle run is happening on the 17th or 18th of August. So we'll probably have that done by the following week, say the 24th of August, uh, and get it out there. So it'll be out, out with, in American time for Christmas. Perfect. That is, that's good to yeah. hear. So And, um, and that's the start. And obviously then next year uh, it'll be a bit bigger. So I'm not sure what, what states will get it and stuff. Obviously, America's uh, individual states are, are different, um, but I'm not sure what states will have it, but we we can get, I can get Megan to get the info to you. Um, I, think that, I think that was only agreed during the week what uh, what states and stuff were happening. Well, I think that's as a, I, I have to give you a big cheers for taking the time to come and sit yeah, and kind yeah. of give us just this, even just a small glimpse of what it is you all are out, you know, to do. And I love, you know, here the society it's all about flavor and yeah. you know really what is inside the bottle and i love that 
you know, you all are highlighting these individual farms so you can really taste, you know, you can taste yeah. the, the, where it comes from. You know, you're getting yeah. all and, of that. And, and, and I suppose the thing is the ultimate aim or the goal has always been to have a cuvee, a grand van. So it's to put them together. And people are saying, well, why? Because each farm is individual. And it's like ingredients. If you build those ingredients, and uh, Mark has said, uh, uh, this is not a technical term, but he said he wants to, to, to create a mindfuck of a whiskey. One that will just mess with your senses and just, you know, you don't know what you're smelling, you don't know what you're tasting. You come back 10 minutes later after leaving it out in the, in the glass and it's different. And I think whiskey is also an atmospheric drink. So myself and yourself, Jenna, are out uh, in a pub having the crack and you'll pick up those flavours and textures from the whiskey. And if I'm at home and I'm after getting wet, walking the dog and I have a fire lighting, the mood will influence yes. flavors and textures and everything from that whiskey. So why does whiskey do that? Because of the complexity of barley. And it's always it's bringing it back to barley. Barley is one of the most complex uh, uh, grains in the world. And what we want to do is let that be highlighted, and let people enjoy it. And like you mentioned earlier about smelling and tasting the three different farms, like one of the things I don't like is people. Not that I don't like it, but you don't have to have a huge vocabulary or knowledge of whiskey. You don't have to say it tastes like this. If you can smell it and it's different, that's it. Like, you know, that, that's what it's about. Like, and, or if you smell it and enjoy it. Now, the other thing is, terroir isn't for everyone. People, some people don't care about terroir. Right. Which is 100%. That's grand. That's lovely. Yeah. But this is still going to be a good whiskey, a nice whiskey. It's not going to be a cheap whiskey. Because of everything, you know, all the inputs and the way we do it, um, and some people won't like it, which is fine. But if you're uh, if you're intrigued or if you're curious, this is definitely for you. And if you like good whiskey, hopefully this will be good. <laughs> well, uh, we're all about the curious. Yeah, I said so. I said someone the other day that the best whiskey is the next whiskey. <laughs> the other thing about it is. Uh, this is the youngest you will ever taste water. You know, so this is a three and a half year old, say, you know, when that bottle of whiskey, when that whiskey is gone, it's gone because everything has moved on. Those casts have moved on. They're going to be a four and a half year old. So this is the youngest you'd probably ever taste water whiskey. And we'll just get older and older. And older and older. Well, I think this is very exciting. And I've been chiming or reading in some of the comments and, yeah, is there any, any questions or anyone giving out or anyone want to know? Yeah. Our, so, Ben. I phone numbers to any eligible females out there right now. Ben, ben um, he, uh, he asked, uh, he said, hey, Ned, are you straddling any barrels lately? Oh, he obviously saw a picture from. Uh, uh, the one Ben took. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, ben. Yeah. No, ben took. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I've tried not to straddle barrels. The, the warehouse is building up, so. Yeah, when he's back again, we'll do another one from. All right, perfect. Well, um, what I'm going to do is I have a lot of pictures of a lot of the things that we talked about today, and uh, I'll go in on our um, SMWS America and post a lot of those so you can see, you know, the uh, the hydro mill and, and the mash filter and the yeah. and the stills, and you know, I'll I think I have a good video of the warehouses at Valley Garen, so I'll be sure to post that too. Um, and so. and just so hopefully when this COVID thing is over, you you will be over. Um, but like if people are, are coming to Ireland, we don't do tours, but when people, if people contact us, we, we help them out, we show them around and all that. And, you know, so if you're over, we'd love to see and, and, and give you a taste and a look at what we're doing. Wow. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out of, you know, I'm sure what was a busy day to, to sit with us and, and just it share a little bit day, about what it, you're doing. This was a lovely end to it. Yes, this is great. So I'm going to cheers you with this uh, Rob Billing almost whiskey. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so much, uh. yeah.
Sanja. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for tuning in. And uh, if any other questions arise, feel free to send them over and I'll see if I can dig an answer out of Ned here and uh, get back to you. So, all right, well, thank you so much. Bye America. <laughs>